Hello everyone and welcome to Durham Heritage Trust and welcome to our December 2020 meeting. Uh, I'm just share my screen and we'll get going. Well, I better, uh, I think, uh, explain one or two things about this this meeting and this talk. Um, usually in December, we have a sort of fairly informal meeting because we've got uh, mince pies coming and everyone's focused on those, of course. And uh, so we often have a member of the committee uh, giving a talk. Well, about uh, 12 months ago, we were trying to plan the program and no one else had volunteered and I'd been thinking about surname distributions. So I thought, uh, okay, well, I could give it, so I offered to give this talk. Well, of course, uh, since then, things have moved on and we're, we're fully online. So unfortunately, uh, we haven't got uh, mince pies laid on. <clears throat> but of course, if that actually makes you hungry, I don't mind if you now pause the presentation and go and get yourself a, a mince pie and maybe a, a glass of wine and we'll carry on. Um, this is a talk about surname geographical distributions. Uh, it's not a talk about surnames, especially. I'm not an expert about sur on surnames. To be an expert on surnames, you need to really be competent in Middle English and Old English and round here, Old Norse, and you need to be used to handling um, medieval documents, and preferably you need to be an expert in genealogy as well. Um, so, but I, I, so if uh, my you know, I, I can't read or speak uh, Old English or, or Old Norse. So if I use Old English and Old Norse words and you know I'm mispronouncing them, uh, please uh, forgive me and uh, you know, I don't mind if you guffle quietly to yourself. But nevertheless, uh, a few basics about uh, surnames to really start off which we have to understand, because surnames originated as by-names to distinguish people of the same given name. So if you have a village with uh, two Johns in, you obviously would get into the habit of saying John Johnson or John the Carpenter or John the Redhead, or if he lived at a, near the hill, John at Hill, or if he came from a place called Ogden, you might call him John from Ogden. And then in uh, uh, at some stage or other, this became hereditary when people started needing hereditary names. Um, and that sort of how those by names became hereditary is a bit of a mystery to me, so I won't try um, and explain it. Um, and uh, another basic fact is that, uh, which I won't go into, is that the most m rare surnames become extinct because um, of course, surnames are inherited in the male line and exclusively male to male line through the generations eventually comes to a stop. So therefore, if you just got a, a name with one holder, that is likely to become extinct or some time or other. Um, and uh, you can show that uh, by a computer simulation or um, probability that you need at least half a dozen holders of a name before it is likely to become established. Now, the importance of that to our present studies is that uh, if, if we find that uh, surnames are just concentrated in one place, which is the whole point of doing surname distributions, that doesn't mean that that has also always been the case. It may well be uh, that those lines, that, that name, uh, was established somewhere else in the country in the past, but has now become uh, extinct. Um, <coughs> so here is a bit of a picture. Oh, <coughs> pardon me. Here is a timeline which gives you a bit of a picture. Now, surnames uh, became hereditary, uh, we're told, in about 1200, 1250 in, in 
um, better off families. I think in the aristocracy, it might have been before that. Uh, noble families might have carried on um, a surname. But it gradually uh, went down the actual social scale so that um, by about 1300, 1350, pretty well everyone in the south had an inherited surname. And it spread from the south to the north. So it, it, it uh, might have been 1350 onwards in the north of England that the names became hereditary. Now, if you look at the, the top box here, um, by that time, uh, people in England are um, speaking and reading Middle English, not Old English. So at the, at, um, at the time of the Norman Conquest, of course, everyone in this country spoke various dialects of Old English or perhaps I should say most people in this country spoke dialects of Old English, um, uh, the same as Anglo-Saxon. And about from in the 1100s that began to change, the uh, structure of the language became simpler, the vocab changed, and you've got a transition from Old English to Middle English in texts. I'm not quite sure about the spoken word. So David Crystal says that the earliest Old English existing text is 1120 and the, sorry, sorry that's, the, that's the earliest Middle English text and the oldest, uh, the, sorry, the, the most recent Old English text is 1190. Now I will have confused you all, but I'll, anyway, the key thing is that by the time we got to inherited uh, surnames, people are speaking uh, Middle English. Um, I uh, Sorry, this is a bit of a long introduction, but I need to tell you also about the sources that I'm using in this talk because they'll be constantly referred to. Uh, and uh, a key one is um, the DVD called the British 19th Century Surname Atlas, which was made by a chap called Steve Archer, uh, obtainable for £15 from uh, Archer software and this has got the 1881 census on it and it enables you to map uh, the um, the distribution of any surname in that 1881 census of which there are 200 odd thousand so it's a lot of course a lot of those there's only one or two uh, holders of that surname so the the maps don't mean much but it is an invaluable tool to, for investigating surnames uh, the uh, the other tool uh, I shall make a lot of use of is the Oxford Dictionary of Family Names in Britain and Ireland. Uh, so if you think that this would be a nice present for Christmas, I have to warn you that it's cost you £400 and, and there's going to be a second edition. Uh, it's in preparation at the moment. I don't know when that will come out. And in any case, uh, you don't have to spend that amount of money because it's online in your public library. And if you've got a library card from a British public library, um, you know, chances are that you are, will be able to consult it for free. And certainly I make a lot, lot of use of uh, Norfolk libraries from, from that point of view. And now before Steve Archer did his DVDs, the, the only way of doing a sur surname distribution, drawing a surname distribution, was to use phone books. And there were about a hundred phone books covering uh, the United Kingdom in about 1980 and uh, this is um, a clip from a Blue Peter show in about 1976 uh, shows them all. So if you wanted to look at a distribution of a surname uh, at that time you had to go through uh, all of these books and count the number of occurrences and you also needed to count the number of um, uh, or to estimate the number of um, other names in the book, as well, sorry, the, the names of the number of people in that book as well, the total number of people, um, regardless of what their name was, so that you could get a relative dis, um, frequency of your surname. And then you could draw a map and that would take you four or five hours. And I know this because when I first became interested in that subject, uh, that, that's the way we did it. And in fact, I had a set of um, 1982 phone books. Um, but uh, when we moved to Norfolk, my wife made it clear that it was either her come with me or the phone books. And well, it was tough, but there we are. I left the phone books behind. 
Um, so I mention that because that will, uh, I shall use some of the old maps that I made. Now, um, another introductory thing is uh, the way in which you plot the distributions. Now, this is the distribution of the surname Took with an E in Norfolk and Northern Suffolk. Um, and the, it illustrates that the 1881 census used registration districts. They counted the number of people uh, within um, districts which were equivalent to the old poor law union. So round here, the, the enumeration district, so-called, was the, um, the Laundich and Mitford poor law union. Um, and on the uh, on this disc on the Archer software, it's abbreviated to Mitford. So I may made a make a mistake and uh, refer to it as that. So with the, the, with the disc, and you'll see me do this, you can either plot uh, the, the um, holders of a surname with, by registration district or by county. Most of the time I should be using registration district. And you can also display the number, the actual number of people with the surname or the number per 100,000 population within that registration district. Now the difference is important. If you look at the left hand one, um, Took, which is the actual number of people counted in the census with that surname, uh, you can see that by quite a large margin, Norwich is the place where there are most Tooks. But part of the reason for that is that there are more people in Norwich, a greater density of people in Norwich than there are anywhere else. So it's not surprising that there are more Tooks there. And in fact, that doesn't tell you very much about actually where the Tooks came from, where, the, where it was relatively the most important. But you can also plot, as you see on the right hand side, the uh, Tooks per 100,000. And you will see that whereas on the left, in terms of total number, Norwich was twice as important as Flegg. When we come to count the number per 100,000, Flegg is much more important. And that indicates that, uh, that this name is likely to have come from that area. That's where, relatively speaking, in terms of the population, that is where that, uh, that name is, is most important. And you can see that Norwich is relatively unimportant uh, for that name. So therefore, for most of the distributions, I should be plotting the number of tukes per 100,000. Now, uh, 1881 census, that is therefore, uh, 500 years after the surnames became hereditary in the north of England, 600 years uh, for the south of England. This is a map of Ogden's per 100,000 in Greater Manchester in 1881. And you will see uh, that it is amazingly concentrated. You see the middle, uh, the Registration district in the middle, Oldham, has 878 Ogdens per 100,000. So that's about almost 1% of the population have a surname Ogden. Now, you, you may well not have known any other Ogdens, and you may feel that you now know one too many, but uh, if you're in uh, northeast Manchester, you can't uh, fail to stumble across them. Now, um, and if you look just to the right, you see Huddersfield is 12 per 100,000. So that is about 20 kilometers away. It's admittedly just over the peak of the Pennines. But uh, even after these 500 years, the name is amazingly concentrated. Regardless of the Pennines, if you go south from Oldham for 20 or 30 centimeters, uh, 20 or 30 kilometers, you're down to uh, Macclesfield, which has only got 23. So that's about a 40-fold drop in, in concentration from the peak. So that was 1881. Now, uh, before we had the Archer software, I had already uh, d 
done a map of the uh, using the phone books of the distribution of Ogden's in Greater Manchester. And I did this, and it took me about 15 years on and off. Because what I did was I took the Northeast Manchester directory, which has got a getting on for 500 uh, Ogden's in it. And I uh, got the address of each of those Ogden's and I plotted the number of Ogden's in each five by five kilometer square in that area. And, uh, and then I did, of course, I had to do a similar uh, thing for a random pop, uh, the, the rest of the population in order to get the, the frequency, a, a sample, random sample of the rest of the population in order to get the relative frequency. It took a long time. Uh, but the final outcome was this contour map. And uh, on this map is also the hamlet of Ogden, where we assume that the surname referred to originally. So the people moving to Oldham might have been referred to as um, the, as, as coming from, from Ogden. And uh, if you compare these two maps, you can see that um, they're broadly similar. They tell the same sort of story, um, except that uh, we don't see the, I, in my data doesn't show the uh, Todd Morden peak that we, uh, we have here, but in terms of Oldham, but you see the peak concentration, the peak concentration in 1980, uh, was about 380 Ogdens per 100,000 population. So that's down by about a factor of two. In other words, my outwards migration, migration uh, in uh, that 100 years has flattened the peak, which is not surprising because of course through by the 19th, 20th century, we have far more mobility of the population than at any time before, I guess. And, uh, and no doubt that in the 40 years since 1980, it has diluted still further. But nevertheless, you can, the, the whole basis of looking at surname distributions is the fact that uh, the distribution population has remained amazingly static uh, since the Middle Ages. And uh, I calculated that uh, in 1980, uh, about 30% of the population, 30% of the Ogdens in England and Wales still lived within uh, a day's walk of the uh, original site of the uh, original centre of the distribution in, in near the hamlet of Ogden. So over those 500 years, we Ogdens, we hadn't moved much. Once we're onto a good thing, we stick to it. But families do migrate and um, so here, here's an example. So the, the name Blenko, which has got two spelling, spelling variants, it's now concentrated in Oxfordshire and uh, Northamptonshire. But it comes from a, a small township called Blenko uh, near Penrith up in the Lake District. Um, and uh, the actual, I met a chap in Oxford, Jack Blenko, I knew him a little bit. Uh, he had actually done the genealogy for his, the family history and he felt that he had identified the individual that, that moved from uh, Cumbria down to uh, Northamptonshire uh, in the late Middle Ages. Now, uh, and since then the family has died out in, in Cumbria by the 19th century, but, um, but there was still a number still concentrated in um, Oxfordshire and Northamptonshire with a scatter in other places. Now you will naturally ask, well, how do we know that that family came from uh, Blenko in Cumberland? And that's where the other source book that we use um, comes in, the Dictionary of uh, Family Names in Britain and Ireland. And uh, you'll see that it identifies um, in that uh, that rectangle I've highlighted, um, it identifies the, the source as a locative name from a place from Blenko in Cumbria. 
And when you look at the list of airy, airy, early holders from medieval documentation that have been identified with this name, you can see where that uh, conclusion comes from. You see the first, the oldest reference is to an Adam de Blanco in 1332 from the subsidy rolls in Cumbria. So uh, if you look at this, doc you know, you've had this document from Cumbria and the chap is identified as de Blanco of Blanco, it's fairly clear that he's come from that uh, hamlet. And uh, the, the next uh, line, um, the next line below, he, we've got him, the chap um, 1592 also in Greystoke in Cumbria, still there then, although the family seems to have died out there by now. And another feature of this is that the first holder, he's identified as Adam de Blanco, Adam of Blanco, so it's clearly identified as a locative name there. But um, uh, the next um, references the de is dropped and it, it becomes simply an inherited surname that originated at this place. And you can see that um, by 1568 we've got a reference in Northamptonshire. Um, the, uh, this is a, a bit of a different feature, we're not now talking about locational names uh, and migration, we're talking about a widespread name um, which is the uh, occupational name of Thatcher. Now uh, in Middle English apparently there were two uh, words used um, for or two major words used for the occupation of, of thatching. There was Thatcher, one which has carried on into modern English, modern English and also uh, the name Thacker. And you can see that the distribution of surnames in of these two names in 1881 was quite different. One was well to the north of the other. And when I was working with phone books, I, I did these distributions with phone books and I actually did a ratio of the two names uh, frequencies in different um, telephone book areas and the vertical lines here are where Thatcher was more prominent and the horizontal lines are where Thacker was more prominent and you will see that there's um, a division, a, a, a border line, boundary line running from the Thames up to towards the Wirral, where uh, which uh, divides the relative frequencies of these two names. Uh, so what it seems here is that we have got a fossil, fossilized uh, dialect boundary which uh, retains the distribution of the the way the word the the occupation was named um, it, at the time surnames became hereditary in say um, 1350. Um, now while I was preparing this talk I found that uh, I knew about Thatcher and Thacker I discovered that there were several other names which were uh, used for this occupation and I got this from the Oxford English Dictionary which is another useful source book we can get from the library and you'll see that um, we've got Thika used in the north of England it means meant the same thing apparently and Thaxter which was uh, predominantly an East Anglian name and uh, especially in Norfolk but if you look at the the one below that so on the bottom right hand uh, distribution you'll see that Reader was actually in 1881 commoner as a surname in Norfolk than uh, Thaxter. So that indicates that uh, in the Middle Ages, Reader was used around here, but also Thaxter and Thacker. Now we have, we, we have to be a bit careful in drawing that kind of conclusion when we're talking about the relative strengths of names because we're looking at the relative strengths in 1881 and it may be just that readers are more have, have by chance been more fertile they've had more descendants than uh, Thaxters and Thackers we don't really know for certain uh, on on this basis that it was uh, the dominant name for this this occupation in the middle ages 
Uh, but if we add all these names together, then maybe we get some kind of indication of, uh, of where thatch was used as a roof covering. Um, and uh, it's not surprising that uh, we don't get it in the West where uh, slate and stone is available. Um, I'm, it's not quite so easy to explain the hole in the middle, especially uh, the lack of use in Essex. Um, another rather similar uh, regional variant of, um, of occupation, occupational names which shows up in surname distributions is Baxter and Baker, which again uh, meant the same thing. And you can see that Baxter is uh, pretty strong in Scotland, but not exclusively so. I, when I first saw Baxter Row here, I wondered whether perhaps it might have been an occupational indication. Um, but uh, I think that uh, is pretty clearly wrong from this. Baxter was never much used around here, apparently, looking at the surname distributions. Um, the, and in any case, I see in the, uh, uh, the, um, the Puddy and Boston book the, that uh, Baxter was a family here in the 15th century. So uh, that seems to be the origin of the name here. Right, <clears throat> so that takes us then to Norfolk surnames. I'll just have a drink of coffee. This again is information from the Archa software disk where you can sort out the uh, some information about counters. And it shows that in the 1881 census, there were 79 surnames, at least 79 surnames, which occur in Norfolk and nowhere else, which I think is just amazing. 79 surnames, which are unique to Norfolk. And there are 302 names, which have at least three quarters of their occurrences in Norfolk. And they, uh, there are 818 names, which have more than 50% of their occurrences in Norfolk. So there are uh, these hundreds of uh, surnames which um, occurred predominantly in Norfolk. And um, it's not quite so, well, it's not easy at all. You can't sort them out by um, enumeration district on the disk. But uh, I have found in the course of preparing this talk 12 names <coughs> Pardon me. I found 12 names which occur more frequently near Dereham, in other words, in our local enumeration district, than anywhere else in the country. Uh, I'm sure there must be more of them that I haven't found. But there are those 12 Dereham names. And Beanie kindly lent me a book, uh, Norfolk Surnames in the 16th Century, which lists 185 names in Norfolk, which have given rise to locational surnames, and there are more. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and here's a, a map of the local registration districts, Mitford and Laundich in the middle. Uh, sorry, these are the poor law unions which were identical. Um, one thing I ought to mention is that Thetford uh, enumeration district overlaps into Suffolk. Some There are some parish Suffolk, uh, sorry, Suffolk parishes, which were in the Thetford enumeration district. And there's quite a lot of the Wisbeach uh, enumeration district, which was in Cambridgeshire. So what I say, when I say Norfolk, I really mean Greater Norfolk. And also I'll include in some of the analysis to Suffolk uh, registration districts, which are Mutford, which is um, sort of just south of uh, Great Yarmouth, and um, at Wangford, which is the district south of Loddon and Clavering. Clavering. Um, probably our, our most celebrated local locative name is Matsell, which comes from Mattershall. You probably gathered. I mean, the modern pronunciation is hardly different. Uh, so that's identified in the Oxford Dictionary as a locative name from Mattershall, Norfolk. Um, and you'll see in this list of early bearers 
the first four people are all listed uh, about they're all about 1400 1300 they're all listed as de Mattachal so it is clear then that they are from Mattachal and then later on uh, the um, by the time you get to about oh well it's quite a long way isn't it about um, by the time you get to about 1400 the Mattachal the the de is dropped and it just becomes an ordinary uh, hereditary surname Matson in its modern form uh, and this is the distribution in 1881. So uh, not surprisingly, it has shifted a bit as a lot of these locative names are. The center now is uh, on the north coast. Um, so some miles were uh, north of here. Um, this is uh, Larwood. I said I, when uh, in advertising talk, talk about Larwood and Flegg, so I better mention them. Uh, the, uh, the dictionary says that uh, Larwood is a, a, a locative name from Larwood, a lost place name in Horsted, Norfolk, which is recorded as Larwood. Um, and then it gives the, uh, I won't embarrass myself by trying to pronounce those later Middle in English uh, instances. You can see Larwood Ling Common. So this is a common feature that uh, the a surname preserves the name of a place which uh, is no longer exists. The name has disappeared from the map. And again, we've got uh, Geoffrey de Larwood uh, in Norfolk Deeds and, and then reference 1303 actually in, in uh, Horstead. So that's how, and, and then this is tied in with this, uh, this place name identified from other sources. If we look at the modern map of this area, of course, it hasn't got uh, Larwood on. That's not su a surprise because it's lost. But you see, there is a Lar gate, which is quite interesting. I wonder if that's anything to do with it. And uh, <coughs> it records uh, Larwood and Ling Common. And you can see Ling Common up the top there, about in the middle, just to the right of centre, says Ling Common. So it was in that area, sort of. Um, northwest of, uh, or north of Horstead, northwest of Coshaw. Uh, but So that's where your local Larwoods come from. Flegg. Uh, Flegg, of course, is on the uh, east coast of Norfolk, just north of Yarmouth. Um, these are the Flegs in 1881. Uh, the, they, but they, they have moved elsewhere too. I mean, it makes sense that a locative name is applied to, applied to people who are actually moved away from somewhere, doesn't it? I mean, it wouldn't be much point in applying it to the people who live there still because uh, everyone would have that name. So it's easy to understand how that can happen. Okay, so this, these are a dozen um, my dozen names from um, uh, Dereham area, and uh, they, there they are listed. I won't read them all, and we'll come back to this list in a, in a moment. Just let's have a look at some of these uh, these names. Okay, Monument. Okay, um, we've had a recent mayor Linda Monument. There she is, and these are the where the monuments were in 1881, majority in Mitford, as I said, and are scattered northwards. Uh, another area name and a celebrated uh, Norfolk name, Skipper. Uh, in 1881, it was centered in this area um, in the Mitford district. And uh, I couldn't find, we're, we're having a talk next year about George Skipper, the uh, celebrated uh, architect. Um, I couldn't find a picture of him, but here's a picture of the Royal Arcade in Norwich that he designed to, to uh, represent his surname. Um, another Durham name is uh, Jared, and uh, Sue Walker kindly found me this photograph in her collection. So that's Jared's shop, which I guess was in the high street, was it? Now, of course, uh, pity I haven't got an audience, I can't, uh, can't ask you. But uh, if I affirm that it was in the high street, I do say without fear of contradiction. And here's Milk's shop. Milk is a name I'd never come across before I uh, 
came to Durham and uh, the uh, but apparently it uh, is a nickname in origin. Buskell, now this is really interesting. Uh, this is a Durham name and and uh, <coughs> look at what the dictionary says about its origin. It's an occupational name from the Old English uh, but Butzikal. Um, so here we are, we've got an Old English occupational name is preserved in a surname which we presume became hereditary in the Middle English period. So somehow or other it was preserved as a by name uh, and which we assume it had dropped out of the ordinary language from its original use, usage. But uh, you can see uh, this note here which I won't attempt to read. Um, it was not just any boatman but it was applied to boatmen in the Royal Navy. Um, maybe not exclusively. And in fact this word does occur with that usage in the uh, Anglo-Saxon Chronicle from the first half of the uh, 11th century. So it's, it's an historically an interesting name and here it is. It's our very own. It's, it's one of our local names and I think that uh, there, there has been um, a uh, Lord Lieutenant of, of uh, Norfolk with the name Buskell, but that's where it comes from. So going back to our list of um, Durham names, uh, you see that we have got several coming from personal names. Um, Leverage, Isbill, uh, Jared, um, we, and Dak as well. We've got some occupational names, um, Buskell, I've just been talking about, and, and Monument and Skipper. They are all thought to be occupational names. Now <coughs> interestingly as well as this old English name we've got two uh, names which are in a way Norman in origin. Apparently the name Whiskar uh, which I knew a family Whiskar uh, in Surrey but I didn't know they came from the family came from up here. Uh, that apparently is a Norman nickname um, and uh, it, it relates to the word wise and also um, the the surname Bloy comes from Norman English from Loire in the Loire. So once again these are names uh, for languages which were not commonly used uh, by the ordinary people in the, uh, the time the, the surnames became hereditary. But the name must have been attached as a by name and, uh, the, uh, and to in, must have been there to become hereditary in the Middle English period. Right, now the, uh, I spent some while walking around Durham Cemetery and um, one of the names I came across, looking for local names, one of the names I came across was Hannant. And uh, I had a bit of help from Tom Garland, so thanks to Tom, helped me identify where the other Hannants were in the cemetery. So I thought, well, I don't know that name. <coughs> I came home, I plotted the distribution, and there they all are, they're up on the northeast coast of Norfolk. Then looking it up in the Oxford Dictionary of Family Names, um, it's a Scandinavian, it says, variant of Anand from the Middle Eastern, Middle English descendant of the old Scandinavian male given them, old Scandinavian, old Norse. So in other words, we've got an old Norse name which has uh, been preserved as a, in the Middle English period, as a surname. Uh, but look at the distribution. I mean, it is where we thought, where we usually think, that the Vikings settled, isn't it? That sort of area along that coast. Um, so could, could this be more than coincident? Could it be that this surname, which is prominent there in the 1881, is actually preserving something from a thousand years before? <coughs> now, of course, we've got the Viking, we've got a big gap. We've got 250 years between the end of the Viking settlement and names becoming hereditary. But it, it, 
this is a suggestion that the name carries on. The name preserves the uh, Old Norse uh, heritage. And that made me wonder whether there are any other names seeing that like this. So I looked at the, uh, the names which have occur well, more than three quarters in the 1881 census in, in Norfolk, looked at all of those to try and sort out what other names there are that might have come from old Scandinavian names and to see what their distribution was. So, and I found two other names which had the Scandinavian origin. Uh, oh, sorry, before we come back to that, this, yeah, talking about Viking settlement, uh, this is uh, Tim Pestel's map uh, from his book Vikings in East Anglia uh, last year. He's curator of archaeology, I think, at uh, um, Norwich Castle. And uh, this is a map of where the, the Norse place names are in Norfolk. And you can see that they tend to be in the north and the east, but not, you know, there's a lot of variation come back to that in a minute. But um, the next name I came was Took. I found this as well. And uh, this is a relationship name, according to the dictionary, from Anglo-Norman and Middle English, personal name, Toka Toka Tuki. Sorry about my old Norse, old, old uh, Scandinavian Tuki, Tuki. And if we look uh, down at these surnames, you see the first, uh, the listing at the bottom, the first one listed is Ormus Filius Toki, the son of Toki. Uh, then um, a bit further on the next line, we've got, a, we've got uh, an 1197 one, um, Walter Filius Toki. So uh, these people are also identified, Filius the son of, they're identified as the son of people who have this, um, given name which has uh, apparently an old Scandinavian root. And if we look at the distribution, well yes it's mainly north and east again. So I kept on looking and the only other one uh, I could find in common Norfolk names was Wilgris, which there are not all that many, but Wilgris is a bit different. It comes from different, doesn't come from a personal name. It comes from the Old Norse meaning wild boar. So it's a nickname has been applied to someone and it's become hereditary. So that's quite interesting, but um, presumably the, uh, the word gris had come into Middle English with the meaning boar. Uh, so if we add all these names together, and it, well, there are various variants for each of these names. There's, there's took with an E and took without. Hannet, uh, the second vowel, an E or the second vowel an A. And then we've got three different spellings of, of Wilkris. Uh, none of them particularly common. But if we add all those together, we get a, um, a number per 100,000. And you can, for the, the whole group of names with this Norse origin, and you can see that they all tend to be concentrated where according to place names, we might expect um, Old Norse settlement. Well, uh, so there was I contemplating this and wondering if it really meant anything. And I uh, happened to be reading the Society for Name Studies in Britain and Ireland, which I'm a member of, their newsletter reporting the conference last year. And the final session was chaired by Patrick Hanks, you read in the middle column, um, who introduced Peter McClure. Now these people are the two of the three editors of the Oxford Dictionary of Family Names. Uh, so they're, they're heavyweights in this, um, this uh, field of place names in particular, and surnames. And sorry, uh, they're, they're heavyweights in the, in the field of surnames, although they do know about place names. Peter's paper was titled, When Strangers Become, Became Family thoughts on the Old Norse contribution to the English personal name stock. So he there, it sounds as if he's given this conference uh, presentation about Old Norse influence in, on um, English, uh, English surnames. So of course I thought this was pretty amazing. So I wrote to Peter McClure and asked him if he got a copy of his 
paper or anything like that. And he very kindly sent me his speaking notes for his, his talk and all his slides. So that was a great gift and very generous of him. So that gave me more names. And to give you an idea of what um, Peter was talking about, this is this name Copeman, which I hadn't picked up at all, but was another Old Norse name which was centered in Norfolk. And Copeman means merchant. It's the same as the English Chapman, same word as Chapman. And uh, there, um, Peter, who knows what he's talking about, has written the old written in Old Norse for your delectation, but I won't try and pronounce it. But it, it is incidentally related to the German Kaufmann, which is a surname which means the same sort of thing. So Peter, in his paper, was relating the uh, the distribution by county, which is rather the registration district, to the Dane law, and he sorted them out into the Northern Dane law. And, Eastern and Western, and uh, talked about that all in his paper. Um, and uh, he he had done this by I mean he's as an editor of the Dictionary of Family Names he's got a database of all these names so he sought out the ones which had been identified in compiling the dictionary as having an Old Norse given name uh, as the origin of the family name. Uh, and he excluded ones which were, the, you know, where the the Old Norse origin was also used in Old English and in uh, by the Normans. So he sorted out Old Norse given names that became Middle English family names, and he found thirty six names, and ten of them had the highest county number in Norfolk. So I then looked at those. Um, and uh, these have uh, these are the ten: Asker, Copeman, Farman, Hakon, Hannant, Thurkettle, Took, Tuli, Tubby, and Alf. And Hannant and Took, as you know, I'd already picked out. So I then looked at the distribution of these other names. Here they all are. And as a general rule, they are concentrated in the north and east of the county. Uh, not the same. Um, Aska, you can see, is northwest rather than northeast. The others do have an eastern inclination, except for Copeman, which is the inconvenient uh, exception. It's a fairly common name, too. And that really is not really very convincingly associated with the, the north and east, is it? But all of the others are, uh, they, they, all tend to fall in with this hypothesis that maybe the, uh, the, the people who are using this kind of name were predominantly uh, in the Norse settlement areas and they remain there at least until 1881. Uh, Copeman, I thought, oh, well, it's an occupational name. I'd, merchant, I don't need to use that, but Peter McClure told me I couldn't do that when I wrote and told him what I'd done, uh, because he said that Copeman is not used, there's no record of it being used in Middle English as an occupational name. So it's an occupational name in origin, but by the time it came to be used in England, it was used as a personal name. Um, so that's a bit unfortunate, but I haven't got any good um, grounds for excluding it from my analysis. So if we add all these names together, I've now got 13 names, including all the variants. Oh yes, I didn't include Wilkris in this because it is different. It's a nickname rather than a personal name. So there's our distribution and there's our two maps of the distribution of uh, Old Norse names. Um, the Tim Pester one I've already mentioned, the one from Nottingham is uh, a bit different. I mean, they're, they're an authoritative lot on names. In the University of Nottingham, they house the English Place Name Society um, volumes and all that kind of thing. Um, and uh, the reason why these maps are different is because, uh, first of all, how, what si size of place do you look at? Uh, do you go down to field names, Wendling Beck, do you count that? Or do you just do settlement ones? The Institute for Name Studies, 
the advantage there is that um, they uh, you can click on each of those things on their website and it will tell you what the name is so you can identify what parish it's in and therefore you can tie it in definitely to which enumeration district uh, it's in which is a bit more difficult with Tim Pestel and why should I want to do that well that takes us to the next slide I thought, okay, we've got this thing, you know, we've got this map, three maps, really. Do they show the same thing or don't they show the same thing? I mean, it's a matter of judgment, really, isn't it, as to whether that, that's got any, any relation, the, the map of the surname's got any relation to the, the uh, place names. I mean, if you're a true believer, if you're really uh, enthusiastic, you might believe it had, but well, hmm, a bit dodgy, really. Um, so I thought, you know, having this background in physics, you don't really believe anything uh, in the natural world unless you can put numbers on it. So I thought, okay, well, let's try and sort our registration, our enumeration districts, according to the number of Norse place names they include. So I've put surnames on one side for the moment. We're looking at these, these um, enumeration districts within Norfolk plus two from Suffolk, and we are looking at how many Old Norse place names they've, they've included. So if you look at the first column, first of all, which is the number from the Institute of Name Studies in Nottingham, I've got, I, I took, a, um, I thought there was a division of about seven. My, I've got this class of registration districts containing many Old Norse place names. And they contain between seven, to be in that class, they contain between seven and 12 Old Norse place names. And then I've, my next class down is contain, contains some Old Norse place names uh, between three and six. And few Old Norse place names, bottom left, uh, is just one or two. And if you uh, would rather stay with uh, a good Norfolk lad and uh, take Tim Pestle's figures, they still group the same way. You can see that um, my many Old Norse place names on the Pestle list is 7 to 17. Uh, and then I've got um, 2 to 6 counts of some Old Norse place names and naught or 2 and a few un under the Pestle list. And then, so I've got these three groups of registration districts. And I thought, um, Norwich and Yarmouth are not going to fit. And the reason is Norwich um, has not got any major districts which have uh, Old Norse, which are Old Norse names, and therefore it doesn't appear, it appears as zero on these lists. But in fact, we know that it's got lots of street names, which are gate, which indicates Northern Sur um, Scandinavian settlement. And there is plenty of archeological evidence of the, uh, of Scandinavian settlement. And of course, if there's archeological uh, evidence, well, you can't say better than that, can you? Uh, Yarmouth, uh, Yarmouth, I thought was a special case because I think it was just a sandbank in Viking times, wasn't it? Uh, so there wouldn't be anything there, but it was populated from the surrounding area. So I thought you've got to consist that, consider those two separately. Uh, right, so um, if, um, okay, yeah, what, oh yes, yeah, so there we are, there's, there's a map. Thanks again, uh, Sue Walker, for uh, making me this, this lovely map, uh, beautiful colors. Uh, and you can see the, reg the areas where registration districts are classified this way as many, some, or few. Uh, now, each of these are treated this way. Let's take the eight enumeration districts classified as having many Old Norse place names. What you do in this case is you add up the number of people, not, sorry, that's wrong, not the number of names, the number of people with Old Norse personal names uh, and the populations in those districts. And so you get an overall number per 100,000 of people with Old Norse derived personal names in those district. That's an overall thing for that class of, uh, for, for the, the many Old Norse place names group. 
And then similarly, you do that for the sum Old Norse place names and three Old Norse place names uh, groups. But um, then you, I've got the populations below. And this is what happens. Uh, now you would expect if there was no Old Norse influence on the names uh, and that uh, all these groups would have the same number of Old Norse related per, um, surnames per 100,000 of the population in the 1881 census. But you'll see that um, the districts that contain many Old Norse place names have about 570 people per 100,000 with Old Norse related surnames. Some we're down about 40% um, on that and there are about uh, four and a half times as many people, you're about four and a half times as likely to have an Old Norse related personal name if you live in a district with Old Norse surn uh, place name as if you're living in an area with a few Old Norse place names. Um, so maybe you better pause the, the distribution and absorb that a bit because I didn't explain it very well. But the key thing is that where there are many Old Norse place names in 1881, you also had a lot of uh, Old Norse derived surnames. Now you think, well, so much. Well, so what? Well, I think it's pretty amazing because you've got this 250 year gap between the last Viking settlement and the start of surnames. So that's a 250 names, so the 250 years that this names, naming pattern has got to be preserved through. And then you've got another uh, 600 years before the, the 1881 census for that whole thing to go, um, you know, to be diluted out of existence. So <coughs> we're not talking about, of course, people having Viking descent. It doesn't establish that, although it may be related to it. But it does show that there's this culture in those areas of adapting Old Norse names, personal names, as surnames. Norwich and Yarmouth, you can see, are intermittent between the some and the many groups. Not surprising. So going back then to uh, where we were, as I've just said, you've, I've just summed it up. We've got these, um, these gaps um, before the surname. And just looking again at our, 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 um, our conclusions in the light of this, we've got uh, surnames we've got from a Norman origin, um, We've got from Brois and we've got uh, Whisker. Um, and this Old Norse word are preserved in surnames, even though that language is apparently um, no longer used. Uh, well, I suppose the, the Norman would still be used, but uh, the, the, um, it re relates to, to a time when the family was in Norfolk, it was in Norway, eh, sorry. Uh, when the family was in Normandy. Um, so you've got uh, a 200, 250 year gap between Old English and uh, Norse settle dominance and the inherited surnames uh, occur starting, but um, the, the naming pattern persists. And also in Norse settled districts, we've got several Old Norse given names get adopted as surnames. So that's pretty, uh, pretty surprising and made me think, well, I wonder if, uh, yeah, I thought, well, this is a bona fide discovery for this talk. So you're the first group to know about this, you lucky people. And I thought to myself, well, I, I wonder if um, I'm the first person to, uh, to come across this. And then um, I began to think about the, surname Took and think well uh, who was the best known Took of the 20th century 
Uh, and it's a pity that I haven't got a live audience because I could see if anyone could guess who I'm thinking about. It was a person who didn't actually have the name Tuke himself, but it was his mother's maiden name. So he might have used it as a security clue or something. But um, his, his, the mother's maiden name was Tuke, and his, uh, in fact, his uh, his grandfather was all, even known as the Old Tuke. And if you haven't got me yet, I'm thinking of the most Tuke famous Tuke of the 20th century was Mr. Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit, um, the hero of The Hobbit. And as I say, his mother was a Tuke and uh, his grandfather was known as the old Tuke. And the top picture here is uh, a picture by um, J.R. Tolkien uh, of, um, of Bilbo Baggins, how he, and the bottom one, of course, is how he appeared in the film. So J.R. Tolkien, of course, was, he was a professor of Anglo-Saxon. I'm sure he knew Old Norse as well. And uh, he had, I wonder if he had tweaked that uh, the name Took was related to the Old Norse name Tuki. I would have thought that it was quite likely that he did. So maybe he has gone this way, I've just gone before. And later, and you know, he said something very interesting about Tooks in The Hobbit. Um, he says, the mother of this Hobbit, of Bilbo Baggins, that is, was the famous Belladonna Took, one of the three remarkable daughters of the old Took. It was often said in other families that long ago, one of the Took ancestors must have taken a fairy wife. That was, of course, absurd. But certainly, there was something not entirely Hobbit-like about them. And once in a while, members of the Took clan would go and have adventures. So this Took ancestry was very important for the Hobbit and the Lord of the Ring. And I wonder whether J.R. Tolkien is saying something here in code about Norse ancestry and that he had twigged that people with this surname, maybe they had a Viking connection uh, a thousand years before. And um, well, I, it makes me wonder really whether uh, if you've got one of these names like Took or Hanant or Asker, whether perhaps, well, perhaps when you're standing on the cliffs at, uh, at Cromer and there's a stiff northeast wind, maybe can you perhaps feel the heave of the deck beneath your feet and the flap of the sail and the spray as your great ship plows through the whales? waves can you do you feel that sort of move of the spirit in the northeast wind well maybe that's that's just too fanciful and maybe we'd better just finish it there and perhaps go and have a mince pie so i'll say good night uh, or good day and hope to see you on the uh, on when we have a discussion and don't laugh too loud cheerio